started. Um, hi, everybody. I am very excited to be here with you um, and to be hosting a Civic Learning Week 2024 event, The Power of Participation and Exploration of Civic Learning in the Youth Development Space. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Civic Learning Week, um, it's a national week that seeks to highlight the importance of civic education in sustaining and strengthening constitutional democracy in the United States by highlighting the civic knowledge, skills, and dispositions that provide the foundation for an informed and engaged populace, Civic Learning Week seeks to further energize the movement to prioritize civic education across the nation. Um, so that is the, um, the purpose of this week of events that I hope people are plugged into. And just to shout them out, um, Civic Learning Week is hosted annually at the national level by iCivics. Um, and the local partner that Citizens Committee for Children is affiliated with is Democracy Ready New York at Teachers College here in New York City. Um, my name is Laura Jankstrom. I am the Associate Executive Director for Civic Engagement at Citizens Committee for Children, where I lead the team in mobilizing youth and adult New Yorkers around our campaigns to improve child well-being. Many moons ago in my MSW program, I specialized in community organizing and then with a, was a youth worker and organizer in New York City for about 15 years. Um, and I also teach a youth policy course for CUNY's youth studies program. So all of that to say that the intersection of youth work and civic or community engagement is a space I inhabit a lot. Um, and it's a space that I'm passionate about in terms of its potential for creating change um, and hope for the future. So it's also an incredibly inclusive, loving space, as you will see when you hear from our wonderful speakers that we have arranged for you to hear from today. Um, so I feel grateful to be here, um, and I hope that all of you on this call will stay connected with us beyond this webinar. Um, and yeah, we'll dive in. So just a little bit of an overview of our schedule. I will just a, a very truncated framing of the conversation um, and then we'll dive into our panel discussion. I'm very excited for you to hear from all of the folks in the room for the panel on different models um, and challenges within the space and also opportunities. Um, and then we'll do some breakout sessions um, just because I want you to be prepared to choose your breakout session. Um, Quickly, I'm gonna give you a little bit of information now so that you can be thinking about it um, for when the time comes. And they're really meant to give you practical tools for incorporating civic learning activities into the programming that you do or aspire to do. Um, so our first uh, breakout is youth voter engagement um, with Olivia Brady from the Campaign Finance Board. Um, it's really about get out the vote efforts um, and how young people can support nonpartisan efforts, um, share data on how get out the vote work supports youth development and also provide opportunities for folks to get involved with NYC votes. Um, and they have great uh, materials for folks who want to get involved in and get out the vote efforts with their young people. Um, Jennifer Tang is here. She is the ONS Youth Leadership Council Director of Research. She's also with the Intergenerational Change Initiative. Um, she feel, feels like she does everything all at once. Um, so she'll be talking about participatory and community-centered research. Um, and this breakout really aims to demystify how to engage young people in research projects and discuss best, best practices. Um, and she'll also give some examples and tools for you to get started on, on how you can do this too. And then that's me. I will lead one on youth-led advocacy, sort of outlining the steps of an advocacy campaign, um, discuss how to support youth through executing a campaign, and also providing examples and activities to get you started. Um, so think about which one of those you would like to put yourself in. Um, all right, and now I will begin with a little bit of framing this conversation, which to me really is about sort of overlapping and evolving models in both the civic engagement, community organizing, youth development spaces. Um, and so there was a lot to say, and I had to say only a little bit, and there's a lot more that we, I mean, we could do a whole webinar just kind of on how these things develop. So um, very high level overview um, for, for you all. 
Um, so the Interagency Working Group on Youth Programs is a group of 22 federal departments and agencies that support youth. Um, and they created the following definition of positive youth development in the early 2000s. Um, so positive youth development is an intentional pro-social approach that engages youth within their communities, schools, organizations, peer groups, and families in a manner that is productive and constructive, recognizes, utilizes, and enhances youth's strengths and promotes positive outcomes for young people by providing multiple opportunities, fostering positive relationships, and furnishing the support needed to build their skills, sense of mastery, and leadership strengths. Positive youth development programs promote a number of outcomes in youth, including social skills, emotional competence, positive relationships with peers and adults, and civic and school engagement. Um, and so, you know, there are many scholars, namely Richard Lerner and Karen Pittman, who helped to popularize and really further define this concept um, in the 90s, which arose out of um, sort of ecological models and psychology and child development, um, are, like that um, talked about how development is not just an internal process, but really takes into account the biopsychosocial nature of how people develop. This model also runs counter to the previously prevailing deficits-based narrative that adolescence is inherently a time when young people start to experience the social and emotional issues that lead to poor outcomes. Um, and that really led to youth programming that was designed to solve problems, right? Substance use, teen pregnancy, mental health issues, rather than being rooted in the assumption that young people have inherent strengths that we can tap into to aid into their development and really lead to those pos positive outcomes that we're seeking. Um, and this is also a recognition in these models, as I was sort of saying of the social realities of young people's lives, right? Root causes created by inequities in society and the protective potential of engaging young people in robust strengths-based programming. Um, and so the outcomes that we really are looking for and that over time have been proven to come from effective positive youth development programs, what they call, it was the five C's, then it's the six C's, we're going to get to a 7C in a little bit, but really it's, it's about social emotional learning, connection, confidence, competence, contribution, character, and caring, right? And those are a lot of the things we talk about as sort of those soft skills that you need for um, a successful life. And then sort of the more hard indicators, like what are we trying to measure over time? Right. Is this our, is the outcome of these kinds of programming leading to increased safety, greater academic achievement, more connection to others, decreased loneliness, those decreased risky behaviors, increased self-esteem and increased life skill development. Um, and so, you know, the, this is, like I said, very high level overview, but this is sort of what the model is. And this is what we're looking for to get out of the model. So if we shift to civic learning. Um, you know, this is really a subset, I would say, of these types of positive youth development programs, right? And I would say that these programs, I wouldn't say more than all other types of programs, but really um, comparatively cut to the right to the heart of those goals of positive youth development. Um, so in the field, we use the term civic learning, civic engagement, youth or community organizing, action civics, right? There's a lot of different things we call it in this space, but the idea is that at the core of these programs, it's exposure to ideas and practices related to being an active member of one's community. The development of agency to speak out about issues one cares about, and really the knowledge and tools to have a voice in the public discourse that impacts one's life. Um, and so he, I, you can find a lot of different definitions all over the internet for this, but because we're in New York, I and the Democracy Ready Coalition worked with the State Board of Regents to develop this definition. This is the one that I chose to bring to you here today. Um, so civic learning empowers youth to make informed decisions for the public good as members of a culturally diverse democratic society in an interdependent world and facilitates the development of civic competencies which are needed for a democratic society to flourish. Sounding familiar? Uh, through civic education, students learn how to identify and address problems in their community or school community. Students also learn how to demonstrate respect for the rights of others, 
respectfully disagree with other viewpoints and provide evidence for a counter argument. So to me, the definitions of positive youth development and civic learning really overlap a ton. Um, and the outcomes, just like positive youth development, right, those that the, that social emotional learning and those improved outcomes is also to be explicitly to be an active member of the community to speak out on issues and to gain the knowledge and tools right so you're going to hear about all different kinds of models that do this today um you know of course we all know about student council and model un um our ccc's youth action program works with young people to understand public policy as it relates to their lives and the process for advocating within the legislative process but other models work with young people like Olivia's to get out the vote, develop public awareness campaigns. Some are issue focused like environmental health or mental health or housing. Um, and like Jen, some conduct research about their communities in order to understand them and improve them. Um, but it's also important to note that many youth programs that do not have a specific focus on civic learning are also doing this. Um, for some like, uh, like Girl Scouts and 4-H really come to mind as two that, that leap to the forefront. Like these things are woven into the language of the mission of the work. But also, I mean, think more informally about the sports team that regularly volunteers in the community, the arts program that's painting murals around town, um, or the cooking club that makes meals for unhoused members of the community. Um, there's like ways for any youth program to incorporate civic learning. And like, I think a little bit goes a really long way. Um, and so we hope we'll be able to give you some of those tools today. Um, so how does any program incorporate civic learning in a meaningful way? Um, so in order to actually engage youth, you need to give them more agency, right? These idea, the idea is sort of auth authenticity and agency. They have to, must like, Youth can't just be people that things happen to, rather the goal is for youth to become people who make things happen, right? So this is leadership development and it's a muscle that is built through exercising it. Um, so only through like authentically letting young people lead will they really develop the kind of agency that we want them to have. And so I bring you a good framework for this, which is Roger Hart's Ladder of Participation. Um, it was first published in 1992 in Roger Hart's essay, Children's Participation from Tokenism to Citizenship. Um, and it's really presented as like a metaphorical ladder with each ascending rung representing increasing levels of agency, uh, control or power that young people have. Um, and they sort of represent a continuum of power that ascends from really non-participation in those green one through three categories to degrees of participation um, in four through eight. Um, it is important to note, though, that the latter metaphor shouldn't be necessarily assumed that the highest levels of participation are always better in all contexts. Um, you know, sometimes there are different circumstances where there's just, you know, different that call for different levels of participation. Um, and in certain contexts, I think that's true for our programs anyway, a lower level of participation is sort of necessary to start for preparing both the youth and the adults that work with them to be ready to authentically move further up the ladder. Um, and then sort of last thing I will say before wrapping it up, um, you know, taking all of this together, positive youth development, civic learning, and the ladder of engagement, we've built up to something that is a more recently developed framework, uh, which is critical positive youth development. And I think this really incorporates um, a critical understanding of the role and impact of power and privilege and oppression on young people's development and personal experiences. Um, so back to those C's, it positions critical consciousness um, as the seventh C of positive youth development um, and as integral to both the learning process and healthy socio-emotional development. Um, and so Dr. Sean Ginwright, a contemporary leader in the youth development space, um, who's encouraged us to involve, evolve our youth development practice from, you know, that catchphrase of being trauma-informed to being really healing-centered, states that the healing-centered approach comes from the idea that people are not harmed in a vacuum, and well-being comes from participating in transforming the root causes of harm within institutions. 
Um, so the belief in oneself as an agent of transformation engenders hope for the future and improved self-esteem along with all of the other benefits we've talked about so far. And it's really pr pretty pow powerful stuff. Um, so now I wanna keep the conversation going by turning it over to our panel moderator, um, Abube, Abube Nueme, to introduce himself and get us started with our panelists. Thank you so much, Laura. <clears throat> Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Ibube Weme. I hope everyone's excited uh, being here this afternoon. I hope you're feeling good, enjoying the wind show out here in New York City. Um, thank you, Laura, for that wonderful introduction to this important event that we need to be having in a year like 2024. There have been huge advancements in the topics concerning youth over the last few years. And it's, it's, it's exciting to be part of that conversation and to keep things moving forward for us all. My name is Abube Wenman, like I said earlier, and I'm a youth leader and facilitator with uh, DYCD's My Brothers and Sisters Youth Council, MBSK. Um, I've been working on various community change initiatives with my peers since around 2019, when I was a junior in high school. And now I'm, in, uh, I'm a senior at NYU studying media culture and communication, and I'm still pushing this, um, this policies and this initiatives because it's important to myself and it's important to the youth of New York City. I'm also a founding member of the NYC Youth Agenda Steering Committee. And we have been pushing that over the last few years and there are many exciting things that are coming up on the horizon for us all. I'm extremely honored and excited to be part of this conversation and to be here today with this group of wonderful, extremely diverse um, youth development specialists who also wear many hats in, their all, in all the spaces that they inhabit. So join me as I welcome Adama Diallo from Citizens Committee for Children, Rachel Castillo from Intergenerational Change Initiative, and Latoria Lovell from WIVO and Next Generation Politics. Thank you all so much for joining us. So as we dive right in, can you please introduce yourselves, um, introduce your program model and how it contributes to civic growth and learning. Um, Adama, if you want to start first, feel free. Thank yes. you. Yes. Hi, Bube. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Adama Diallo. I am here with Citizens Committee for Children of New York. I am our civic engagement associate. Um, I run all of our youth civic engagement pro um, programs. And as um, we talk more throughout this um, whole um, webinar, we'll talk more about our programs, but for the program model that we use here at CCC, um, we currently have three programs which we scaffold. Um, so the first and the um, lower, the latter part of the scaffold, we have our internship program, which is the Youth Action um, Internship Program, where um, it's an introduction to advocacy. So our young people, the young people that we um, bring into the program, we teach um, and we go through the motions of the steps of effective advocacy and going through looking at their community, their experiences and um, identifying needs and, and, and at community assets and needs in, the, in that um, program. And then once young, our young people are have gone the year with us, they graduate into our Youth Action Membership Program, which is where they take a little bit more ownership of their own projects. So they've already um, um, identified their, their priorities, the issues they want to work on in the internship program, and they go on to the membership program, um, taking on bigger projects and really uh, leading the charge in, with those projects. And then we also have a peer trainers program, um, which is just a select group of young people who have a great grasp of what advocacy is and have the the um, desire to teach other young people um, and to develop their own public speaking skills. And so they go around, they spend the first half of the year really developing their advocacy um, workshops, um, we have budget, um, we talk about the budget, New York City government and all of that. And so we develop that and then they go around the later half of the year um, putting on those workshops for other youth groups. Thank you so much for having me out. Thank you, Adama. Adama, if you want to just uh, keep going on how, like, how does the program, how does it contribute to like civic growth and learning and like society and just for like the young people in general? Yeah, I think as Laura just mentioned with the latter, right? So we do start off kind of a, a, a guide, we guide them with uh, through how to do research, um, how to analyze your uh, the 
things happening in your community, how to translate your own experiences into data and all of that. And then so from there, we usually have the end of the year project, which is when they really start to take action and start to um, take ownership on their own um, projects and actions. And so, um, and then we go into the membership program, which is where this year, like where they're facilitating, they are um, planning, um, they are promoting all of their own um, initiatives. And so really our biggest contribution, I think, to young people is uh, giving them the information necessary at the beginning and then um, giving them the support that they need um, once they feel ready enough to take on their own actions and to, um, you know, use their voice, um, use their own voice as opposed to us um, use it, like telling their stories. Telling their story. Mm. Awesome. So, Thank you so much, about it. Latoya, you want to go now? Hey, y'all. I am Latoya Lavelle. Um, I'm with YVO in Next Gen Politics. I am the Director of Youth Research, and I'm going to really project y'all because we have a booming voice next to us. <laughs> um, I'm the Director of Youth Research with YVO, um, and I do a lot of different things, pretty much overseeing the research-related things within the org, um, whether that be through our initiatives with youth and research or through generally thinking about our program impact measurement and reporting out on those processes. So a little bit about YVO. Uh, we are a youth-led organization that really, we have civic engagement programs and they have several different focuses. So first with our Changemakers Institute, uh, the purpose of that one is to mobilize our youth at and beyond the ballot box um, based off of things that they are passionate about. And we do that through an advocacy and organizing lens. We also have our Democracy Camp, which is a week-long focus where we hone in on key issues and principles within democracy um, over the week and then throughout the year, youth elect or opt in to do a full year democracy project based off of um, issues that they really care about. And Youth Agenda, I have the pleasure of working on the Youth Agenda with the amazing people here. So Abu Bay Adama, Jen, Rachel, Laura, uh, I think there are others, but I can't see y'all, but hearts. <laughs> um, and we have our Next Gen program and which is really, youth-led civic discourse um and really our program and model is we elect and we have a really intentional youth leadership model and where we intentionally craft and curate our programs in order to ensure that youth are expressing agency um their own agency fully and they have the they feel fully empowered to learn be equipped with the tools to go out into the civic landscape and do some of that civic work on their own, but really also um, to go off and be spark plugs within their communities. Thank you, Latoria. Rachel, you want to? Sure, I'll jump on in. Um, if you know me, you'll know that I use like things like alicious a lot. And I'm realizing this is a very research alicious kind of theme moving through all of our um, organizations, which is so beautiful. And I think which is why um, we are like a, such a, a strong coalition. But my name is Rachel Castillo, and I'm the program manager of the CUNY Intergenerational Change Initiative, or ISI for short, which you'll hear me use. Um, and I am also honored to be on this panel today with brilliant colleagues that I do, um, that I'm in coalition work with. Um, so ISI is what we call a collaborative community of youth and adults co-researchers. And I'm gonna give you some of our pedagogy at the top, which I think really speaks to like how we see civic growth and learning. So we work in partnership, young people and uh, uh, um, adult co-researchers to conduct research that really centers the diverse and dynamic lived experiences, perspectives, needs, 
and dreams and hopes of young people across the city. Our approach to research joins a very long tradition of what we call participatory action research models that share some really key principles, one of which is no research about us without us. So young people are knowledge producers and they are centered as the experts of their lived experiences. Um, we also see that it is our responsibility to share our research and findings back with others, especially those um, who are most impacted by the issues that we are researching, because we know historically and traditionally research has been owned and driven by those with access to power and privilege. And so this is about taking research back and making sure then that we are sharing it back um, with the purpose of activating um, around what young people are learning. So not only do we collect research and data, but what are we seeing? What are the systemic roots to some of the issues that young people are um, articulating? And what are the things that are going to begin to shift these issues systemically on a policy level, on a community level? So that's really our, like, our pedagogy about how and why we conduct research. It is youth-led. It is predominantly young people. So it's a few, a little bit of us adults trying to hang out and be cool with youth researchers, but we truly do work in partnership. Um, and just to give you a little taste of how we're structured um, through the school year, we are a bit of a smaller cohort, um, somewhere about up to 10 young people from ages 14 up to 24, but it tends to be high school and um, college aged. And we work together all year long. And then we really expand during the summer when we become an SYP program and do a more, more of an intensive but we, we study the history of research in this country. We look at it through a social justice practice. We're, think, we're looking at diverse and creative research methods. We're applying them. We're looking at focus groups and interviews, conducting street interviews. Elega Latroyo, who's done that with us many moons ago. Um, we, we use things like sidewalk science, where we're stopping community members real time to engage with some of our interactive data collection methods, looking at arts-based methods. And one of the biggest, which you'll get a taste of, I'm sure, when you're hanging out in one of the working groups today, I mean, one of the breakout groups is our annual digital survey, which is called the Youth Ask Youth Survey. We will be launching its fifth year this year. Um, and we pumped that out for about six months. And we try to get as many responses from many as many young people across the city around many different topics and issues. We close the survey, we analyze, we share the findings in coalition in the New York City Youth Agenda Coalition. And together with young people from other organizations, we begin to really think about the policies and the shifts that need to happen. And then we take it to the table, we meet with elected officials and coalition, um, we share our findings and we ask for committed follow-up meeting, long, long-standing partnerships and meetings so that we can really see um, these things shift sustainably and not just kind of one-offs. So it's kind of in a nutshell what we do. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rachel. I don't know, we are in for a treat today. We have, that's what I say, we have a very great group, very diverse in like what they do in spaces of youth development and civic learning. And so this is gonna be amazing. Thank you so much, Adama, Rachel, and Latoria for joining us again. So I just wanna start like my first question being like, when we talk about like civic learning, like even myself being as a young person, it's not really the most exciting thing you want to do as a young person. Like, you know, you want to go play sports or hang out with friends. So when you just civic learning, so, so, oh, you just like a little nudge to like, oh, come learn about this or come do this. So like my first question is kind of like, you know, many programs have like hooks to draw in young people to, to learn about civics, like sports, like arts, like some, some programs do picnics and different leadership clubs. And they even go into like chess and checkers and debate. Like we could, I could keep going and going because the list is endless. But so like there are many entry ways in which you could promote or even nudge you to come learn about. So my question is like for programs like ours or like for our peers that are here on this call with us today that do have young people that, that interest that are, that are running programs specifically in or explicitly in the civic lens how do they you know how do they like help young people or what are the activities that these groups can engage in to develop civic learning and then my second question is you know as leaders of programs that that don't have maybe like an explicit you know, civic plans, how can they hook in young people to come learn and to come, you know, engage with, with the civic learning that we are talking about today? 
I know it might be a little too long, so if you need me to to go over it after a few seconds, just feel free to just. Hey, wait, wait, what's that question again? I'll, I'll I'll put it back in. Thank you. Yes. So first, um, I think that being open minded is really important, and just really developing or staying open minded to developing a broader understanding of the word civics and civic engagement in general. And then being able to communicate that in a way that isn't intimidating. Um, I think civics as a term is really slightly a, a really intimidating term. Um, and most people, when they see that word, uh, they associate civics with voting. Um, so I think that's like one of the things first is really this pre-misconception around what civics is. So just being open to understanding that civics is a bunch of different things um, and it doesn't just consist of voting. What it really is, um, it's individual and collective actions that are designed to help you identify and address issues of public concern. So really people are doing civic engagement work, youth are doing civic engagement work with not without necessarily naming that that is happening. So a lot of times when people are introduced to civics, they're not really being introduced to civics, they're being introduced to the terminology. Um, so I think that as far as activities goes, um, when thinking about, first just thinking about like what civic engagement is, and then thinking about ways to like organically fold that in, because you can do that in many different ways through like art, through writing, through debate, activism. I choose research. It sounds like a couple of other us, of us chose research as well. Um, but then thinking about how to integrate some of that stuff into what you're currently doing um, I think so for the second part of your question of how do you like incorporate activities that are beyond the scope of civics, I don't personally feel like things are beyond the scope of civics just because that is the understanding that I have of civics currently in my brain. Um, I think for why though, we really take on an issue based learning perspective. And instead of like trying to engage youth in civics, we engage youth in what are the areas that you are passionate about? What do you care about? That's how we go into engagement. So really just finding all youth have the capacity to be passionate about something that is civic, because I feel like all youth have something that they care about, whether it's within their communities or their families, their schools, what's happening within their culture or where they come from, there's something. So I really think tapping into like who your students are, where they live, what's going on around them, is like the way to like go into doing some of those things where first and implementing some of that work into your own programming. And then there are levels. So starting at level one, get to eight. There's challenges along the ladder of participation, but really just taking an issue-based approach is really like our angle at Vibo. Yeah, I'll jump in. I think I'm next, which is so beautiful to scaffold um, off of what Latroy is saying, because what I want to offer actually comes out of a lot of what Latroy and I have thought about a, a lot, especially in our coalition work. I mean, it's these three words is thinking about like research, history, and then making space for dialogue. Because I think at the base of all civics, again, whether you use the word civics or not, young people are are um, living bodies of constant civic engagement, right? They're constantly engaging, thinking, processing um, in any program, whether they're in a program or not, whether that's the explicit like pedagogy of that program. So I think starting from that place and validating and acknowledging that, but I think one of the things that's really interesting is really using history and the history of the city and understanding the ways in which migration, which is a big word right now, but migration and movement has always been the heartbeat of the city and how young people can always find a way to connect back to that heartbeat in their own um, histories of migration, whether it's their direct and most initial or for those who have come before them. And so 
I think that's a really beautiful inroad, no matter what program, to begin to lay the foundation for some like real critical thinking and critical conversations that then can lead to then ideas about, you know, kinds of projects that we might want to do. So something I think about chess, I love that chess is there. So I think about growing up in New York and still to this day, thinking about the men often playing chess in like in um, Union Square Park or down, you know, up in the Bronx or in different places or thinking about, you know, thinking about public, thinking about playing games publicly, right, in communities. And so if you're like, oh, we're just a chess, we're just a chess program, there's so much there. So we can think about like, how do we bring in history or that historical lens of like, what has been the history of chess in this city? Who has had access? Who hasn't? How did young people get chess programs into theirs? And having those kinds of conversations and inroads then begin to create opportunities for young people to maybe think about like, how do we want to amplify this as this beautiful activity? Or how do we want to, you know, or maybe something's fading or disappearing as we're learning about this history and we want to, so that I think there's just, I think history research and then making space and time for young people to talk about it. And I think that's very important too, because sometimes we're just so fast, but to have the dialogue is where I think so much of that civic spark really happens. And I'll kick it over to Adama. Yes. Um, so my my answer to this question, to both of these questions, is going to be art, um, history, and movement and conversation. Um, I think regardless, uh, so my background is in theater of the oppressed, which is rooted in pedagogy of the oppressed. And we focus a lot on using art to kind of, as Latreya said, civics can be intimidating, so can conversations about people's experience. Um, and so we use a lot of those like improv art games. I use a lot of those in my um, programs at the beginning of the year before we even get into the research and all of the more logistical things um, to just have young people in a circle. I've, I, I've had so many young people say like, we don't get to even have these discussions in schools. Um, uh, just go through the motions of like, the games sometimes we play the games and they don't even know like that this is a game that has a purpose like at the end when we get into debrief questions and we get into the conversations that's when it's like oh wait this game was Im to imitate um something that happened in my life and it, it takes the pressure off of um having um these kind of deep and necessary but very um invasive conversations sometimes. Um, it, it, we have those conversations in a fun, um, light uh, fashion. And I would say for, uh, so this, that question, that one was for more of like um, programs who are rooted in civics, um, just to have it be a less intimidating and to demystify what civics is, because I agree with Latoya and, Rich, and Rochelle, uh, a lot of people, um, a lot of young people, when they hear the word civics, is intimidating, and um, using art can really um, alleviate that intimidation. Um, and then for programs who may be more arts based and want to usher in more civics, um, I would say, um, again, just having conversations, bringing in the history about a lot of these programs, even a basketball program. I know uh, we talked about chess, like a basketball program talking about the history um, goes into more about like, how has the community um, gone through the different eras and it can bring about the conversation of what's happening in the community now. So like finding that thread um, between okay, what is this thing that we're doing? What's the history? What are the changes that have happened? And how can we make a change? Um, and so, yeah, I agree with both uh, Latroy and Rachel. Rachel. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Latroy, Adama, and, and uh, Rachel. I, I, I agree with everything you said. I, I, going back to, to history, and like Adama said, the pedagogy of the oppressed. I think that's like really like the, the the research all that is important in making sure young people understand what civics learning is like what, what it what it entails and when we talk about civics going back to the roots why are we the way we are why is society the way it is like it makes us i think long, young people i'm speaking on the part of a young person like we want to we want to talk about these things we want to have these conversations we are not scared of this conversation in fact we don't like it when adults showed us out of these conversations because this is what we want to talk about 
So when to to further and push us in advancing youth engagement and, and to make us more to make us participate more in, 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 in conversations, we need to talk about these things. So that kind of like leads us into our next question. Cause like earlier we heard about the ladder of engagement, right? So my question is like, what are some ways youth protectionists could can can progress to higher levels of engagement in young people? So when we talk about giving young people more agency in their decision making and supporting their leadership development, what are ways we could engage them more in in and progress to this high levels of engagement and get it out of young people? Well, I think I'm first up. Um, so I think it kind of also still connects a little bit back to the previous question, but I think one of the things that I've become very conscious of, and we recently as ISSI just had like a mid-year, like kind of brunch assessment, celebrate ourselves, but also like assess our progress and where we're at. And when we went around, it's like, what are, what is one of the things that we feel we do really well and we want to do more of? And for me, with my adult, like whatever it is, I'm waiting to hear like really technical things about our research and what everybody consistently said was, I love the space that we make for dialogue and for different kinds of dialogue, right? For like, for opportunities to socialize, for us to talk about and get down to work and hone in on our work. But what was really beautiful about that is that when you make that space, that's when you begin to actually hear the different skills and passions and talents that young people have that then can really feed the work that you may not hear if you don't create that space for different kinds of dialogue and different moments. So I think that has been a really big learning because I think for all of us in youth work, any kind of work, right? We know we have like deliverables and this and we have structures and we got to get this done. And sometimes the, the, the richest things that are going to really invest in youth leadership is making space for young people to emerge and to articulate what they're really well at or what they feel really good about. So that was just a big learning for me. Um, a tangible thing is this year, we um, actually have a, a youth co-lead who meets with me weekly to develop our, our weekly sessions and who is also kind of able to kind of come out. And so that I, I, I don't want to be an adult in many spaces talking about this work. It's always beautiful to be with a young person. So we, we figured out a way to kind of invest. I'd love to see that expand. Um, I mean, there's other opportunities. There's other examples as well. But the last thing I'll say about a challenge is understanding that young people are balancing a lot. This is our work. We are being paid for it. We are balancing a lot. And I think it's okay also to like say to a young person, take it as far as you can. And when you can, or if we have a timeline or a goal, flag it and say, I need you to pick it up or I need that support to bring it home, but let's stay together so that I'm carrying through your vision, right? So I think that's an interesting thing. Sometimes we can do the two extremes. We can step all the way back. And then it makes young people feel not successful or we can lean in too close. And I think that's a, I think that's not a challenge, but it's just a, it's just a consciousness for us to always carry through our work. And I kick it over to Adam. Yeah, no, but even so before sorry. Adam, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. That, that's perfectly fine. No, Rachel, I want to say, I'm glad you also spoke about like challenges. Cause like, even at the beginning, we said this, like civic is not the, the most interesting thing to a young person. So bringing up challenges is like really important. So Adama, I'm sure if you want to also speak about challenges or answer a question, that uh, it will give us more insight. Like, yeah, no, I agree with Rachel about just giving more time and being intentional about um, holding space for conversations um, in my programs, especially at the beginning of the year, the first part of what we do is have conversations and play those games that bring even more conversations out of us and help them explain like go through their the experiences that they've had and really analyze like how that those things made them feel how um it affected them and so for me when we get to the more to more of the research stage once when, when i realized so the in terms of like the challenges when i realized that i have to do a lot more of like the um, giving information in terms of research and things like that, in terms of what to research, how to research. Um, that's when I know that that that's the challenge, right? Because had through the those conversations at that stage, like um, the hope is or the idea is that they would have um, had enough dialogue to understand what is what are their what they're passionate about with the, 
the issues that they're passionate about, um, to be empowered to do to even do their own research at home to from the conversations that we have in the session to be like oh I want to learn more about that and then go home and do their own research and so for me um it is about being more intentional um in the beginning stages um especially like with community building making sure that they're comfortable speaking with each other and voicing their um experiences their opinions and then going into uh more of the research uh, based activities um, when it comes to programming. It's so funny. It's like, I can tell that I've worked closely with y'all because I echo both of y'all's sentiments, but I'll add to it. So just to, I guess, first lift up what you both say, um, some challenges for me within this is both of what you named. So doing a process of unlearning and relearning needs to happen when you enter this work. Unlearning of systems when you come in. So when you start at that ladder at level one, um, I think that level of participation is not just for you. It is for adult practitioners in the work as well, because we have other things to do when we're entering into this. So the first thing is really thinking about hierarchy um, and hierarchical structures within youth development. You, um, teaching and youth, teaching and school is a space where youth are in a predominant amount of their time. And we really have to think about in our programs, um, if we want to intentionally connect with youth, how are we doing that? Um, and how are we folding them in, in a way that is meaningful where they don't feel like they're at school? Um, so how are you creating a different environment? And I think keeping that in mind while you do that work is what gets it youth really engaged because they feel more invested. Um, at the beginning, like it's things start off with a little bit more handholding, as Adama said. So they'll need to be equipped with the skills. They need the skills. They need the knowledge. Um, and they need help, kind of like figuring out what are the pathways within that. And I feel like that's the adult role within the work. So really thinking about what can you do like what can the, the thinking about what to where to step in and where to step back it needs to be like really really intentional where it's like okay what can youth do that I normally in my regular hierarchical roles of power would not have let them do like how would a teacher have done this versus how would an ally do this um is really a question that like I keep in mind um and then relearning again when it's appropriate to step back in because it's like identifying where youth need assistance without overstepping that agency that you want to give them and empower them with. And then also Echo and Rachel, it's really, really important um, to do this work in full collaboration. So when you sit down with a young person, you're not this adult who's in charge and knows more than this young person because they have different knowledge and different skills and different experience and we can learn from them as well so I think being in like true collaboration with young people is really like putting yourself on an equal playing field to help them but also to be helped um yeah I think that's my answer <laughs> yeah. thank you Latoya um yeah just to go on what you said I think in this process there's a lot of relearning on learning even like demystifying like you might come into the space with like previous knowledge of like oh i know this and like you have one or two conversations like wait i need more research and that's i'm like rachel like you might have a conversation with me about this because i don't really know that much like i thought i did so also like being humble to like you know be in that space to actually learn it's important both for like a youth perspective and adult and so and that kind of like, I want to talk about outcomes a little bit. So like, what does success look like to you? Both from that perspective of like the organization and then the outcomes for like a young person and for young people. So if you'd like to answer that. And I'm, I would like you to go first. Yeah, so as an organization, success for us really looks like, again, we are, we are a research-based organization. We do a lot of research um, and for us, having our young people inform what we do is the most important thing. Um, we um, 
we look at their experiences, the things that they're willing to share with us, um, the um, projects that they take on, which highlight the issues that they care about. And each year, like we come up, we come out with like our healthy house, uh, educated and safe, but with in that they really, we do really look a lot to um, what the young people are seeing within those different um, pillars that we um, that we work with. And again, just having participation, like when we're going up to Albany, um, the young people are excited to go and they are preparing. They know exactly what they want to say because the, again, these are the campaigns, the, the um, bills that we are advocating for. These are things that they themselves um, prioritize. Um, and then as uh, in terms of like our young people, when I think of success um, when uh, with them, it's whether they're in our program or they're somewhere else, um, as long as they keep, keep like the advocating spirit within them, um, I, I am happy. Um, I know for like when they're going off to college, even if they're not specifically participating in civic engagement programs, um, they may start a club, they may be more vocal about things happening in their um, in their colleges, in their communities. And as long as I'm seeing that, I'm happy and I, I, I can rest assured that like the skills that we've given them, they're still um, practicing, even if it's outside of the civic engagement space. I think for me, just so as someone who my job was to look into why votes impact and really report out on that last year and looking throughout the whole year, I think, yes, success looks like to me being able to say that we have like high civic skills growth from our programs, but it's also in being able to like understand that when youth feel empowered, like it helps mitigate things like depression and knowing that we have youth that leave where their voices are heard or they are feeling like they have agency over their own life that we're possibly like mitigating that experience of like mental health and well-being within just a couple of youth. Um, Or like as Adama is saying, like when for me, it's like when I, f I have a youth and they like get fired up about their thing, like, you know, everyone finds their thing but it's like this person is like really into like I don't know like racial justice and they're like blah blah blah, blah, blah. they're looking for programs and they want to be connected to other things they're looking for the next thing that really looks like success to me um and or when you like go out into the world and they find things on their own and they're happy to share them with us like via email or text or whatever it is that lets me know that we did a good job planting that base of like youth feeling and knowing that there are things out there um, and that they're on their own pathway and trajectory that does feel really good in the work. Yeah, I know we're winding down, so I'll try to be concise. And I will offer a little bit also as a mom, not to maternal or paternalize it, but I think macro, but it is very micro, but it is also macro and it is self-advocacy. So it is knowing that young people, not just externally, but even within our program, build that strength and that skill to be able to self-advocate and communicate. And so one of the one of the things that we've been talking a lot about is like, this is the place to do it. This is the place to grow it and strengthen it. So if you are struggling or you're having a hard time or you're going to be late or you're going to miss something or things are like, this is where I want them to feel like they can build that skill. Not that that's we're the only place, I'm sure they're doing it in many places, but we, if they can do that within and internally, then they can do that with a policy, with a, an elected official, with a college, counselor with whomever in life as they go on so I think like this idea of really um, nurturing self-advocacy even internally within the program and, and supporting young people to communicate their needs um, is like I think is the nugget for us that then builds their advocacy everywhere yeah thank you all so much for your responses and, and I can just tell like from from your responses, we could tell that they have you've achieved that success like over and over again. And like moving forward, we'll definitely continue to to achieve that success despite the challenges that come along the way. There'll be young people both in our space and even when they leave that space, the things that they learn in your organizations, in your spaces, and things you've impacted young people, it would live on. They would continue to carry it on to other young people. So thank you all for, for just sharing that.
Um, unfortunately, we are getting towards the end of this conversation. Not that I would ever like it to end. I can speak about this for, for hours. Um, but just as we as we get to that point, I would just like to give you an opportunity to shout out any opportunities or any programs that you have coming up and you would like to share with us uh, and with our audience today. I do. I'm sharing a couple of links, y'all. <laughs> so that's a one to pager about our Youth Civic Hub project. I know we have two minutes, but the Youth Digital Civic Hub is a project that has been being built out by youth over the course of a year and a half. And it's going to be comprised of a bunch of different civic tools and knowledge where youth can go and uh, register to vote, figure out who their elected official is, find opportunities within their communities, join other orgs, and just generally like learn about what's happening within civics, the issues that they care about, and their their neighborhoods, their peers. Um, so that's a little one pager about more in depth what it is. Um, yes, Santa put the link in the chat. Thank you, Santa. That was my next link. Um, <laughs> and also, if you have youth who aren't necessarily um, connected to civics, or like I said, everyone's connected to civics, but haven't found the language, um, I would love you to email me so we can possibly like get them involved in some of this work that we are doing. Please email Latroy, y'all. Yeah. Thank you, Latroy. <laughs> think I'm up next. I'll be quick. Um, it's not all the things, but if you want to check out um, results from our 2023 Youth Death Ask Youth survey, you can go to Amplify and check them out there. We will be opening up the new survey probably sometime between May and June, and we hope to conduct such robust outreach that all of y'all just hear us come across your um, Pat, but if you're th if it's coming around that time, you want to reach out to us as well. Please ask us; that'd be amazing. We're open open to partnerships all the time. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things to share, but I know go for it, uh, Adam. I'll pass it to you. Yes, um, I have two things. I'm going to try to be brief. So the first one that I'm putting in the chat is um, our youth action membership program participants. As I said, they take on their own advocacy program uh, projects. Last year, they did a um, session where they asked young people about um, youth justice related um, issues and things in schools and communities and about the investments that they wanted to see. This year, we're trying to do it statewide. So we've already held a couple of sessions in New York City. We're looking for any um, groups of young folks in Westchester, Long Island, um, and Buffalo, um, if you would like to participate in these listening sessions that my young people are facilitating. Um, and then second, I'm going to ask for this to be sent over in an email, but we are also working with the New York Presbyterian Hospital. Um, they are looking to create a, a hub in central Brooklyn, and um, they've asked our CCC and our peer, my peer trainers to um, do a youth assessment in, with young people in central Brooklyn to just figure out what's nest, what's needed in that hub. Um, and so we are holding those sessions both online and in person and in, in Brooklyn. Um, and I'll have, I'll, we'll send out more information about that if anyone's interested. Thank you all so much. For, again, unfortunately we're coming to the end of this panel. We still have the breakouts from coming up, so don't go anywhere. Um, but I would like to thank our esteemed panelists for a thoughtful, amazing, brilliant conversation today. I will now turn it back to Laura. She closes out this panel and we open up breakout 